here on the JR the Boss Man Show. Here with former Kansas State head coach Lewis Preston, he's an agent. Uh, coach Preston, uh, how life up there for you guys, man, up there, up North Cobway, man? Life up here is good. I uh, can't complain right now. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, you got all the stuff going on in the NBA in light of everything today. So just kind of just taking it all in and, and uh, seeing how we can get better as a society right now. Mo definitely, Coach Preston. I want to really talk about your journey because uh, <laughs> you were at Kennesaw State and then you transitioned into the private world outside of coaching and now you're an agent. So talk about that journey from how one journey stopped when you coached at Kennesaw State to where you're at today, Coach. I think it's a great transition going from the floor to being an agent and, and like how have you done it. So, so let's talk to the listeners about that, Coach, if you don't mind. Um, the, the first thing in regards to that, JB, was, you know, I coached for 17 years, uh, had a great coaching career, very fortunate to work with, I think when it's all said and done, you know, two Hall of Fame coaches and uh, Mike Bray, worked with him for six years at Notre Dame, uh, worked with Billy Donovan, was fortunate enough to be a part of that second national championship squad at Florida. Um, and then, you know, from Notre Dame to Florida, then to Penn State. But before all that, I got started at Coastal Carolina with Pete Strickland, who was also my college uh, assistant coach. So having a chance to have that type of a career, then becoming a head coach at Kennesaw State, not working out the way that I wanted it uh, for three years. And then I actually stepped away from the game. Uh, completely for about two or three years, went out into corporate America. And uh, now I work with the BDS agency for Brian, with Brian Stanchak on the men's side. I've been doing that now for about two and a half years, representing college coaches. The main reason why I decided to do that was to help coaches not make the same mistakes that I made and kind of uh, be that 30,000 foot uh, view, overall objective view, have an experience in uh, coaching and then making sure that they're they're doing everything that they need to do to be the best coaches they can be, not only uh, on and off the court, but also within the community and within society. Most definitely, Coach, because having somebody who's been in, that, in those shoes, to be able to represent them, we're dealing with ADs, booster clubs, all the people that deal with to get a contract done. I'm telling you, having somebody who's been in that fray and knows is, is very crucial, Coach, and I think that's a great thing. And uh, Because, you know, I, I know a lot of coaches in the business, of course, as you, as you know, and knowing some how, how the deals come mm -hmm. around, how they're structured, and they can get tricky. And they try to run running run game on, on these guys, but having a guy like you, who knows the game to represent them? They can save them from some mistakes and sign some bad deals and get get them messed up down the road or have the contracts terminated before they want to. You know, so I, that's great. I, how you can be able to represent those guys out there, coach? Yeah, I, I think one of the main things right now is is like everybody's trying to figure out this whole COVID piece, and you're starting to see this with contract extensions and things of that nature. How? how to try to navigate that. So, you know, I think during these times, especially when there's some financial uncertainty, especially at the collegiate level, uh, how to navigate those murky waters, but also at the same time, making sure that you don't ruin a long-term relationship uh, and knowing that, once again, as, as, my, as my mom and dad would always say, tough times don't last, tough people do. Yes, so yes, this indeed. is one of those tough times. We've got to figure out how to get through it. Most definitely. And, you know, I noticed this carousel this time around was very light. You know, and I was happy with that because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of guys didn't lose their jobs. Because the carousel usually be, is usually about between 50 and 60 jobs, but they open up only in a given year in college basketball. This mm -hmm. year, maybe like 25, 26, 27, which I'm happy for. So I feel like COVID gave some guys an opportunity because you know this, as I do, Coach, that sometimes ladies and presidents get very impatient. You know, you give a guy mm -hmm. a, total, a total rebuild job, you only give him two years, three years to get it done, and he needs to build his, his own program, correct errors from the last staff, and and build it up. And year three, you haven't won as much as you want to win, they fire on that guy. So, like, you know, when you're trying to structure, structure a deal, I'm assuming you try to get some protection, allow a guy to actually to 
build his program out the right way, not rush him. Two or three years, he's out of there. And we're doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the main things in regards to that is if you're starting to really pay attention to collegiate athletics, a lot of times you're not able to go through a cycle of recruiting uh, within that four-year span before there's changes made. Uh, if you're successful, most of the time you're able to move up in the coaching ranks uh, to get a, you know, a power seven, hopefully a power five job. If not, if you're on the other side of it and you're, you're being terminated, it's, it's making sure that you do what's best to not only protect yourself in the short term, but also the long term. I think for us, I think one of the things we've been fortunate uh, is having a young man that, that I think is going to be a star in the coaching business, a young man, Marlon Sears, who actually um, just this past offseason, he's the new head coach at, at Amherst uh, up in the Northeast, uh, up outside of Boston. And I think one of the things that's amazing about that is – building those relationships, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, you got to control your controllables the best way you know how. And I think what COVID's done, uh, hopefully, to a lot of you, a lot of coaches is to get reconnected, not only with their teams and with their staffs, but also getting reconnected with their families as well, because I think that's very important uh, as you continue to navigate through these times, because as we've seen today, you've got certain things going on right now that I think these are going to have longer term effects as opposed to short term effects. Yes, indeed, Coach. And like you kind of alluded to with the Milwaukee Bucks and uh, the Orlando Magic, Bucks play his game, and now the Thunder and the Rockets are not going to play, and we'll see what the Lakers and the Blazers are going to do. But it's time, Coach. You know, like I've pretty much – used my show since June, Coach, for the greater good of our people because I'm 33 years old, so I understand, you know, what can happen to a young man in college, to a, to somebody older than me because, you know, I live in it. You know, my parents grew up in the civil rights era. My parents are 69 and 79 years old, so my parents lived mm -hmm. it. You no, know, I'm the first one in my family to be born for rights, for example, the Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, civil rights. I'm the first one to be born, and that's 87. My parents went born with four rights when they was born. So it's a new day, Coach, and I feel like I gotta, I've used my show for good to help affect the Atlanta community and beyond via the World Wide Web and the podcast world and the digital world because the message is clear. It's time for a change, Coach. Right. And, and if you've paid attention, I, don't, I do not think there's been an NBA coach who's been as involved as Lloyd Pierce from the Hawks. Mm -hmm. in regards to social injustice and social change and being involved in the Atlanta community uh, during the protests. Uh, I think one of the things about the NBA that they do a great job of is that they, <clears throat> they have come together collectively and voiced their opinion and voiced and continued uh, to put it out in the forefront because I think right now, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that want to try to get back to some semblance of normalcy mm -hmm. and to try to create some distractions to get away from what the message is. And I just going to continue to go back and say this: we got to keep making the main thing the main thing. And uh, the racial, the social injustice that's going on, um, just watching everything, just in our country right now it is something that's eye-opening to me, being the father of two daughters, you know, um, living in Northwest Georgia, uh, living a great community. I'm not gonna take anything away from the Cobb County community. I think it's one of the best communities in the state to live in, but also at the same time, you know, you're 33, I'm 49 and, you know, you, you just don't know on certain things what could happen. So we got to make sure that we are aware of that and we continue, we continue to educate. Here's the four words I keep talking about all the time through this, and we talk to our clients about this as, as well. You've got to communicate. You have to educate. You have to empower, right? And then once you empower, 
you have to go out and continue uh, to have empathy and compassion as we continue uh, to learn, to grow, and continue to be a part of the change that we want to see in this world. And coach, you know, um, I, I had never felt this way like I feel after George Floyd, coach. And I, deter I decided, hey, I have a, a show with a platform that ranges deep. I need to use my voice for good. And, you know, coach, I'll be honest with you. Now, I'm, I'm just going to say it on, on the air here. I've lost four sponsors. I've been talking about social issues, racial issues. I lost four, four sponsors. I don't care about it because I'm doing, doing this for the good. That shows me about them and where they stand. So as long as I'm about the Atlanta Hawks, the Atlanta Braves, and the, and the Falcons, it's all good. Let's talk, let's talk about me as a black man. It's a problem. So that shows me where, where, where they stand. So, coach, I feel like, you know, I, I've, li I've lived it. I've been on, had to be on Medicaid. I've had to be on food stamps. I've had to not have access to health care. All these issues that, that, that are in the forefront, I've lived them. So I'm going to speak on them. And, you know, it's now it's about coach, to my mind, right v. wrong. It's not right versus left. It's right versus wrong. Do you want to be on the right side of history? Wrong side of history. Are you for the people or are you not? So... That's why I'm with it, Coach. I feel like it's time for us to be, be real about it. If we want equality in America, we got we to gotta be about it with our actions, not just our words, or just, or just thoughts and prayers, and move on with our, our, our day. Right. And, and, JB, as you talk about that, even from a deeper perspective, um, at the end of the day, we're both black men. And if you've looked at the statistics, it hasn't been very favorable, um, you know, but we're also in a day and age and era that where social media is probably at its all time high. Mm -hmm. So with that, there's a variety of different platforms. I mean, you see what's going on with the NBA, with the equality shirts, uh, with the different things they're doing in the bubble. I think what Chris Paul is doing with the different HBCU shoes uh, that he's wearing every game, um, you know, how players have shown a united front in their post-game interviews, coaches in their post-game interviews, you know, talking about the different things that's going on in America. Um, we have to get to the point to where we have to have the uncomfortable conversations. Yes. And... I will go back and say this. I'm willing to be reasonable as opposed to rational with this. And what I mean by that is when you have rational thinking, you try to find people that follow or believe in what you believe and you go off in your group. When you talk about reasonable, you're willing to be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But willing to be wrong knowing what you believe in, but once again, it comes to having the uncomfortable conversation. If you want to try to run away from this situation, it's gonna eventually catch up to you. And I don't care if you are a uh, power five athletic director, I don't care if you are a power five, power seven college president or senior administrator, I don't care if you are a coach, uh, assistant coach, support staff, players, you have to have these conversations. And we're seeing something right now that is so unprecedented that, and I'm talking about with COVID and then with everything else going on, it's almost like a perfect storm of events. Most to where you have to talk, all right? Because if you do not communicate now, once again, I'll say it and I'll say it a thousand times, it's going to come back to haunt you later on because here's what I tell my coaches. How in the world can I, as a coach, during this time, not have these conversations with you, but then at a very critical point, I blow the whistle and I'm going to say I demand 100% of you. How can I demand 100% of you on and off the court when I didn't give you 100% of me? Most definitely when you need a certain questions answered. That, that right there, you know, and I don't even coach anymore, and I've laid awake at night about that. Because once again, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, a cousin, you know? So, I mean, how can you do that? You, this is something that's, in my mind, is very hard to you know, compartmentalize. 
I think you have to meet this head on and be willing once again. And I'm going to say it again. Now I'll say it until, you know, I go hoarse. You have to have the uncomfortable conversations. You got that right, Coach. And, you know, that's what I've been trying to stress to my white friends. He's like, look, it's time to talk about this. You can't run from it no more. You can't hide behind, you know, the Bible or God. This is right and wrong. Now, you, you, if you feel about that, I'm pretty sure Jesus will be on the side of the protesters. If you're really about that, right? If you're about that life, you tell me you are. You can't, you can't hide behind policies, how I was raised. It's right and wrong. It's time to evolve. You know, I'm just going to say it. Uh, conservative means to keep the same, to conserve, to preserve what it used to be. It's where it's it's time to progress, not regress. You know, Coach I said it on my show, and I, I I've offended some of the listeners by saying it, but it's just, Coach, I'm an important man. I I do I'm doing this for my for my father, my mother, who are of age now, of age now and can't talk anymore. Like, I, but I have a platform. As their son, who you know, two parents who grew up who was allowed him, Martin the King got assassinated, and told me how it was Now he, he got killed in Memphis that, in 68. They both told me how it was. So I have stories for days from my parents who grew up in this area who can talk to me about how it was. So I'm, I feel coached, like I've been called now, I've been calling to use my sports platform and what's been given to me by, my, by, by the grace of God and my talents but for but for a different cause. Now, use, still doing what I do for a living, coach, which is cover sports, but also give people the life and the real, and how it really is as being a black man in America, and how we make make this change today and get uncomfortable to make the systemic change happen. Right. And and I will go back and I will say this as well. I think there these are emotional times. Okay, we have to be strategic with the emotion versus logic. And what I mean by that is we all can logically say George Floyd was murdered. I've, I've yet to see a person say that he was not murdered, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we move on from, from that and not move on to forget about it, but to move on to make sure it doesn't happen again? Now, I have, I have former buddies that I play basketball with that are police officers, right? And in talking to them, they give me a much different perspective, right? But they also give me the perspective of being a black man who's also a police officer. So those, those things I, I do take into consideration. And that's the reason why, as I'm speaking right now, I, once you take the emotion out and you just think logically about this, and I take, you know, I, I, this to me is not about politics. This is just about right and wrong. Most right? Definitely. You know, and, and, and what we're trying to do is teach, you know, the next generation, the Gen Z generation behind us, you know, right from wrong. And that we've seen a lot of wrong this happen. We've seen a lot of right this happen during this time too. Because I think with times like this, there's great opportunity, right, to make sure that we don't have history repeat itself. And I think we're living through uh, a, a form of history that's repeating, and then hopefully it doesn't happen like this again in either one of our lifetimes. Yes, indeed, Coach. You know, I can say when I see my little cousins who are five, four, and two years old, they're so innocent. And just don't understand what the world they're in. You know, I, I say, you know, I, I wish I had it, their innocent minds. But I don't, it's like I, I, I don't sleep well sometimes thinking about, you know, how can I protect them? How can I make sure they're okay? You know, because there are three young, young little black boys who are growing up in, in Starbridge, Georgia, not really knowing at their age what's going on around them. But I see it every day. I try to also tell my cousin, you have to talk to him about this. You can't run from him. He, he doesn't want to, he's scared to kind of think about it because those are his three boys. But you have to prepare, prepare yourself as a parent and eventually prepare them for that talk you have to give them that, you know, so they can be ready for it. I'm trying to prepare his mind right now, because it's, it's very key. We have, we, we, we like you live in up North Carolina, I live, in, I live in North Henry County here. So we are in great parts of town, great communities. But reality is, if we go a little bit farther out, 
it's just Georgia. <laughs> you know, it's just the real Georgia, you know. So we have to be, be prepared for that as well. So I try to tell my cousin, we have to always have our stuff out on the dashboard there. Don't make any sudden movements. Care yourself a certain way. So we can always, hey, don't be a threat. Don't present yourself a threat. Cause you can, cause even if you're not a threat, you can also get killed sometimes. But try to listen. All things you can is where it can go sideways. And don't try to win a traffic stop in the streets. They'll never happen. Try to be, you got to beat them in court if you, if you make it to court. So that's trying to teach my cousins and teach and teach my, my listeners these, these, these concepts. Coach, I'm trying to get us to be protected down the road and save us from a bad outcome if we possibly can. And I think, and I think with that also, we have to. Um, I keep going back to the word educate, and we have to empower. And I think we there has to be a level of empathy and compassion in regards to all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I go back and I think about this all the time. I, as much as possible, I try to take the emotion out of it because I would not want. Uh, to work in a job to where I got, I was a paid on the emotions of what my boss or supervisor or somebody was going through on a day in and day out basis, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to take, you know, to an extent the emotion out of it, but it's also an emotionally charged time because we keep seeing this stuff that's happening and, and we're like, it, when is it going to stop? And I don't have an answer to that. And, and going back to something I said earlier, when you're talking to coaches and you're saying, you know, you know, talking about your white friends having these conversations, I think th these conversations to me cross all color lines because with it, there's a level of vulnerability you have. This might be one of the first times that as a leader, it's okay to say, I don't understand. You know, uh, I don't understand what's going on with this right now. But, you know, if I'm talking to an individual student athlete, if I'm talking to somebody, you know, on, on my staff, if I'm talking to somebody uh, within the athletics department, maybe you have somebody in your family that's going through it or is going through it, help me to better understand it. How can I better educate my team through this? Um, what are some examples, you know, historically, that we've seen in regards to this because that these aren't interesting times. These are horrifying times. Most and definitely. We have to, we have to come to some type of, I, I'm trying to find the right word here. We have to, balance isn't the right, we have to come to a mutual level of respect for human life Most at definitely. the end of the day. A mutual coach. respect of human life. Like, I do not walk out of here, out of my house, you know, uh, I'm not a, I, I don't carry guns. I respect people that, you know, want to carry guns and do it. I don't walk out of my house with the intention of trying to do harm. I walk out of my house every day with the intention to, to try to bring some good into the world the best way I know how. Sometimes that's not for everybody. You know, sometimes people are just in a different place, but I think another important thing we have to do is meet people where they are and then try to help elevate from that, you know, particular spot of where they are. Once again, we can lead people to, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Sometimes you can give all that you can. And then some people just don't want to accept it. And with that, you got to have the intelligence and the, and, and the wherewithal to know when to move on. Uh, to the next one, because there's always, to me, going to be a next one out there. It's what I loved about coaching. There's always a next one that you can go out and have the opportunity to help change their life and impact their life and help to watch that light bulb come on. Now, Coach, uh, I know you've been out of the game uh, for a few years here. Do you ever forget the urge to want to get back into coaching, or do you feel like that, that life has passed you by Do you want to get back in ever? The life has never really passed me by. I've stayed involved with basketball, whether it's doing some different things with the Hawks Naismith Classics or uh, with Marcus Burnett and SUV TV. Uh, was doing some stuff with the Georgia Hoop Circle, contributing there. I contribute to a variety of different things in regards to basketball. I love the game of basketball. It, it afforded me the opportunity to get a college education. 
It afforded me the opportunity to travel the world. It afforded me the opportunity to impact uh, young, young men's lives. Uh, I met my wife through basketball. Uh, my two daughters were born when I was a basketball coach. So uh, basketball's had a, had a very positive impact on my life. So, you know, uh, I'm very strategic now in, in how I use basketball because at the end of the day, I always in different talks. Did you use the basketball or did the basketball use you? And hopefully it's you use the game of basketball to take you to those next levels in life as you transition out of that sport uh, to whatever you want to do next, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's coaching, whether it's uh, politics or whatever, you know, fill the platform you want to go or use. Now, Coach, you know, the, the real, a lot of MVPs of, of being a coach is the coaches of wives. So, um, so let's talk about how your wife has supported you and your daughter supported you because I know that's really a, the, uh, the untold story of a coach is how the wife holds down the home or the coach is out recruiting, traveling, you know, game planning, you know. So let's talk about how important a coach's wife is to the coach being successful as well. I always tell people that a coach's wife is, is in, in, that's the right way to put it. They're the real MVP because, you know, we get to hide behind four walls when things aren't going well. And I can walk in my office at 6 a.m. and don't come out till 11 at night. I can control that. But, you know, they're the ones that have to take the kids to school. They're the ones that have to go to the grocery store, you know, uh, or uh, historically, uh, I think we've evolved to a better point now to where as, as men, we're more involved in regards to those duties, especially during COVID. But, you know, they, they hear more of the rumblings than you do. And then another part as coaches, you know, we kind of tune that out for the most part, knowing that part of signing that contract is, you know, there's going to be some, some Monday morning quarterbacks, some armchair quarterbacks that all have the answers but they're also the same ones that are never willing to uh, put themselves on that sideline for 40 minutes and see what it's really like to try to control an environment. So, Yeah, because I'll tell you what, you know, uh, you know, I can only imagine how coaches and wives have to deal with all the ups and downs and you come home <laughs> mad after a tough loss on the road or a trip and just having the support of your kids and your wife to come to kind of make you forget about it for a few minutes about what just happened. Because so having that support system in the home, man, is so important. And I, I just admire coaches and wives and what they deal with and how they keep the home stable and steady while the coach tries to make it right on the court for his program as young, as young men. No, oh, and, and not only do are they basically, in a sense, kind of like the moms to the players that you bring into your program, but they also are the mother to your children. You know, uh, they carry on a lot of responsibilities that I think are uh, not highlighted the way that they need to be highlighted when you start thinking about a coach, whether they're successful or not. It, it's just a lot of the you know, a, a lot of the responsibilities that a wife takes on, uh, they kind of take on your identity as well. So, uh, you know, as much as we talk about, hey, coach, are you okay? I don't think we talk enough about, you know, are, are our wives okay? Are our children okay? You know, because, I mean, I have a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. Uh, those can be some very interesting times in, in, in young people's lives that, that where they – there's a lot of stuff thrown at them. Yes, and indeed. When you, have a, when you have a parent that's a public figure, a lot more stuff can be thrown at you. You got that right. And, you know, Coach, you know what's a little blessing about it, you know, is that, hey, is it, you're impacting young men's lives. So let's talk about that part of the equation of coaching, impacting a young man's life, uh, helping him become a, a, a great husband, father, worker, whatever, after that ball gets to drop and using, using the basketball, use them for better. So uh, let's talk about helping these young men that you've coached over the years grow into being, you no know, great men in a society as they are right now. Uh I, I think one of the main things that, that I enjoyed about uh, coaching was the relationships. Um, you know, we always put a game plan together on how we were going to develop them on and off the court. But, you know, the main goal was to make sure that they would be productive men in society in some way, shape, or form. Uh, 
uh, I've always felt that one of the greatest compliments you could ever receive is when a player, you know, lets you know, hey, you're getting married, get a wedding invitation. Um, you're actually in a player or assistant coach, coach's wedding, um, baby announcements, things of that nature. Uh, I, I think those things resonate because we all talk about the two to three to four years, but you really want it to be a 40 to 50 year relationship. Uh, and that to me is the main reason I feel like a majority of coaches coach, uh, especially within my age group. I think another thing that we have to look at now is how are we preparing, you know, our future generation uh, of young people that are players, um, you know, in regards to those next steps, how are we helping them if we haven't learned anything from society, you, you have to be a, you have to understand the value of change, you know, because if you don't change, you're going to become obsolete. And we're always evolving as a society, whether we want to admit it or not. So hopefully we're evolving in the positives and not, you know, evolving in a negative way. Now, Coach, this is one question that my listeners want me to ask you. I, 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 want, I want your perspective on this. Um, coach, what's the difference between when you're working as an assistant coach vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. being a head coach? So if you can break down for my listeners, uh, the difference between when you're an assistant and then when you actually become a head coach, how responsibilities are divvied up based on in each, in each role there? Uh, I'll, I'll keep it very simple. As an assistant coach, I made suggestions. As a head coach, I made decisions. Most Those two words, suggestions versus decisions. Um, if it's a good decision, you look like a genius. If it's a bad decision, you're going to take the brunt of the hit. Uh, you know, I always tell people the, the, the common denominator uh, between, you know, coaches. Uh, I mean, we have records, you know, and, and whether, whether we like it or not, you know, some people say your record says who you are you know, as a coach and everything. And sometimes you don't understand all those circumstances that go into it. But the main thing is, is definitely the suggestions part versus the decisions. Um, I think when you start to put your staff, I think it's the most important thing you can do as a head coach is have the right staff. And then having that right staff to be able to delegate the responsibilities to where as you're taking on other responsibilities within your program, whether it is uh, speaking to the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Clubs and things of that nature, uh, that everything on the practice floor, in the film room, uh, study hall, class checks, that all those things are still being done and you don't miss a beat. Oh, definitely. I'll tell you, I, I, I describe it as like being a CEO of an organization. <laughs> That's how I was describing it to my listeners. But they want me to ask you, because you are a coach, so ask him that question. I said, I'll ask him for you guys, because I'll give you what you want. And <laughs> you gave it to him simply right. as you could. Just the same as a, a, a co host radio show, suggest versus decision. Mm -hmm. like, I'm the, I'm on the side of what I cover and I don't cover. I'm going to take a suggestion, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> you know, so I right. think you laid it out so perfectly right there. Coach, I'm like, that's basically what's higher, higher it is. Right. Well, here, here's the interesting part right now, JB. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you really paid attention to college athletics, a lot of your ADs were former coaches. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start to look at college athletics now, uh, especially at your Power 5, Power 7 lo levels, a lot of these ADs or development. They know how to raise money. They're not necessarily former coaches. They study sports. They didn't necessarily play them. Uh, so that's where you're starting to get more the business mindset of the CEO terminology and things of that nature. And then a lot of that also has to go back to when we had conference realignment and the money started to get really big. Uh, felt like you needed more business people as opposed to once again having those former coaches and i think with that you've had some somewhat of a disconnect between your administrators that are more money people as opposed to understanding you know what coaches go through 
So, uh, and I think that's something that as we continue to evolve, you know, hopefully to get back to that side of having coaches, having athletic directors and administrators that have experience with that respective sport, as opposed to just watching it and, and then trying to make those decisions without knowing what a coach really goes through through those different seasons. I got two more for you, Coach. And first one is about uh, the money as well, Coach. Uh, a, lot, a lot of non-conference schedules for the lower major schools, lower major schools are, are in jeopardy because of COVID, you know. So, mm-hmm. and you coach at Kennesaw State, so you probably had to raise money, play guarantee games and money games. If those games are not available to fund athletic departments and uh, at fund and non-revenue sports, uh, how are these schools going to survive sports-wise through COVID if, if there's no non-conference games for men's basketball, women's basketball, or, and also football? Because I fear for those – those universities who depend on those, those those opportunities to make money for the university, and now with COVID, they might not have the opportunity to do that now. So how so how you feel about that? How's going to shake out now with those schools having to be in this precarious predicament right now, where where the money might not be committed this year to fund everything? I mean, you know, it, it is a very it, it it is a tumultuous time right now because you have decision makers or decisions that have to be made if those those dollars are not able you know to be you know found through playing your guarantee games and and you know there's there's a I think it's above 50 50 whether you'll see college football or not this year uh, which takes a huge hit in regards to your athletic budgets and things of that nature and if you've really been paying attention you're starting to see athletic departments talk about furloughs. Uh, I just saw that the other day with Clemson talking about furloughs. And the, those were, the, that word right there, or layoffs, things of that nature. So it is, it, it's very concerning right now. Um, and hopefully we can, re, we can correct this and understand that, you know, this is an unprecedented time, but there were things along these same lines that happened back in 2008 with the financial crisis. And once again, hopefully we can learn better moving forward in regards to that. That's what I got for you, Coach. Is, uh, I wanted to ask you about Coach uh, Peel, Randy Peel. He, he's the guy who brought us together. Yeah. Uh, he told me to reach right. out to you because you was a great guy. We both here in the Atlanta area, so he, he wanted to make a point that we connected. So tell us about Randy Peel, how you know him, what he's meant to you in your career, and what and stories you have about Coach Peel and what, his, his, his love for basketball. You know what? Uh, Coach Peel is one of the hardest working uh, coaches I've ever been around. Uh, what I love about him is what you see is what you get. You know, uh, I grew up, you talk about your parents grew up in the civil rights era, mine did too. Uh, my dad was a crane operator and a, cu- and a custodian. So honest days work for honest days pay. You know, and when, I, when, when you talk about Randy Peel, that's what you see. Um, loves giving back and pouring back into young people. Uh, has stories for days. Uh, I've always, I, I love going back and talking to uh, the people that have come before me to help pave the way and talk about how they had to adjust to how times have changed. I mean, you think about Randy, I mean, he started in this business when there was no rules to where you have rules. You know, I mean, you used to be gone. I remember when I first got into coaching 17 years ago, we'd be gone literally the whole month of July recruiting, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so you pack up, I mean, you pack up bags and, you know, I, you have a Nike bag packed, you know, loaded to the top. Like, all right, I got to get, try to figure out how to get 10 changes of clothes in here. And then, you know, you either using the hotel wash machine or whatever and, I mean, it's, it's amazing how it's changed, but the game's still the same because you got to figure out how to put that ball in the basket one more time than the opponent does. 
Most definitely. <laughs> Most definitely. But Coach Press, this has been an honor to talk to you. It's been great. It's a lot of, a lot of ground here today with you. We got to do this again real soon. And I hope to come up there and see you guys real as we get some lunch one day when it's the safe route, I guess. <laughs> you know, we going to have lunch somewhere around here one, good, one of these good days here, Coach. And you know what? You come up to this area, I'll take you to a good spot. And then when I come down to Henry County, you take me to a good spot down there. We'll, we'll even it out. Yes, indeed. Coach, hey, Coach, thank you for your time. This was a pleasure, man. JB, the honor was all mine, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right, Lewis Preston here on the Boss Man Show. Sally Beauty's new all-in-one hair color kits make it easy to color your hair at home. Get everything you need to color for beautifully radiant results. Loved by professionals, open to everyone. Sally Beauty. All right, you folks, back here on the Boss Man Show. Hill Sacred Hearts basketball coach, Coach Anthony Latina with me. Coach Latina, how are you and your family doing so far up, up there, man? I know it's been a rough time for us all, man. Talked about it off the air, man. But how have you and your family and your team been? You know, it's, it's uh, certainly been different. Um, there's been some challenges. You know, I, I, I try to be a person of gratitude and appreciation. So I know that me and personally and my family and even our program have it better than most people. So I always try to keep that perspective in mind and come from a place of gratitude because I am very blessed. My family is very blessed. Our program is very blessed. Our school is doing great. So those are all things that are not the case for a lot of people in this country right now. So, so for, with that being said, for me to complain, I would feel very, uh, it wouldn't be right. So kids are doing great. I feel bad. You know, they, they're, they're hopefully going back to school in like a hybrid model in the next couple of weeks. My son's going to be a senior and our, uh, my daughter's going to be, well, I could say our son, my wife and I's son, and our daughter is going to be, She's going to be a sophomore. He's going to be a senior. So they're both athletes. We're hoping that they uh, are allowed to play and hopefully things get better. So, but again, um, I try to, like I said, come from a place of gratitude because uh, I know I'm very blessed. So uh, we'll get through this. And um, I think there's been some positive. I've been able to spend a little more time with my family than normal. Normally I'm traveling in the summer a little more. So that, that's been pretty cool. I think from a, a relationship with my children and my wife, there's been some added benefits that I think, uh, I think been, I've been very uh, fortunate to be able to experience. So, so but we're, I'm excited to be uh, talking to you from my office though. I get it, you know, the last couple of weeks I've been coming into the office, but there was a stretch there was, I, I was only in our, in our office for one or two times in four or wow. five months. Yeah, wow. so it's great to be back. Yeah, coach. From a, I, I, I like work. Hey, the same here, you know, for me, Coach, it's been weird to be doing Zoom interviews now, but I like it because I get to see you guys now rather than the phone. So it's kind of been that new wrinkle. It's kind of been good to see, see people now rather than just be on the phone. So working from home now, going to spend time with, with my dad, who's turns 80 years old today. So going to spend time with my oh, dad. That's great. I so, hope you just spend time with him. Yeah, so the blessing of the pandemic is I spend time with my dad, man, because you know, he's up in age now. You now I'm 33, but he's up in age, so getting to spend that quality time with him, I don't usually get to spend with him, so it's been great. I'm used to doing the Atlanta Braves in the offseason from the Hawks, so so now I'm doing the spend time with Pops and enjoy him, Coach, so I'm blessed as well, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. I wish him a happy birthday. I, I can relate. My father's 87, so every day is a blessing, you know? Most every definitely. Now, Coach, you know, it's funny. Uh, the NBA stopped on my birthday, March, March 11th. And so when everything went down, uh, how, where were you and your team at? And how did you and your staff kind of map out what to do with your players after everything got canceled and everything was starting to shut down in March there around my, around my birthday there? Well, we were actually still scheduled to play in a postseason tournament. So obviously that was a little bit of uh, a letdown for our guys because we, we had a special season. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 we understood and everyone understood the situation. And it was, this was a, a, you know, at the time, nobody knew anything. You know, nobody knew, you know, uh, obviously this is, has been a serious thing. But I think at the time, you know, there was a serious concern that, you know, people were just going to be, you know, that, that, that as bad as it's been, I think the expectation was that it was even worse than this. Yeah. 
that, that was my sense of it. And I think that was the sense of certainly people on our team in our campus. So I don't think not playing, um, although disappointing was not that big of a deal, but you know, and then we just wanted to make sure, you know, our, our school sent everyone home. So we wanted to make sure our guys were doing well. You know, we were in a little bit of a transition because, you know, we had a few seniors. And then of course, as college basketball works, you know, they're, you know, when you, when you have some success, there's some depart at our level, there's some departures, which, you know, we were dealing with. So we were just trying to make sure that everybody was in a good place mentally, that everyone was safe and healthy and really just try to support our guys. And then once we had to deal with some of the transfers, which we expected, you know, which is again, part of the, part of the deal at this level, we then had to come up with a game plan of, all right, we're going to have to recruit <laughs> some guys. And, and so recruiting was a big focus of ours while my staff and I were all working remotely. So, uh, you know, we, we were able to sign a few international players through some contacts of ours that, that we love, that we res you know, respect and trust. And we were also be able, able to sign a couple of players that we had seen. So, you know, we're going to have uh, nine new players on our roster of a roster of 15. So, uh, and 10 new players, uh, that didn't play last year, you know, someone else set out. So we're a whole new team. And once we got the roster situated, now it was a question of trying to get to know each other remotely, you know? Most and definitely. There's a lot of our guys, I mean, we had 10 new guys. Out of the 10, five or six of those guys had never met any other player on our team face-to-face because -face they didn't go through the traditional – recruiting process of an official visit and those kind of things. So Most definitely. it was really, really uh, an interesting, unique time. You know, I've been coaching for 25 years and experienced nothing like that. I mean, even the recruiting process, doing virtual um, tours, Zoom, you know, virtual Zoom tours of campus and, you know, things of that nature were, were uh, it was great. I mean, I feel like I learned a lot. You know, that, that's the interesting thing. You know, there's been a lot of negatives way more negatives than positive, but there have been some positives in terms of use of technology, Zoom. But one of the things I, I, with my kids, now my kids are older, again, one's going to be a senior, one's going to be a sophomore, my own, my own children, is we should never have a snow day ever again. Now, in the Northeast, that's something you deal with all the time. I'm scared Atlanta, of snow, coach. Those, I'm scared of snow. Atlanta, snow shuts us down, man. Inch, we're done here. <laughs> but my thing is this, we should never have a snow day ever again. Just, just if it's snowing, Zoom it. Have a, zoom it, no question. So this Way, in terms of you know in, in having younger kids at time we know when they're going to end we can plan for the summer summer programs things of that nature so I thought that was a positive and and then my you know be able to my use of technology and zoom and and being able to have some face-to-face -face contact with with friends that are at a distance I thought obviously we had FaceTime but uh you become more comfortable with this so so that that's kind of what we've been doing and, and so now you know, some of our players have moved in. A few more are going to move in today. A few more, everyone will be in by Saturday. And we're really excited. You know, it was, um, it, college is going to look very different. Well, everything's going to look different. But, you know, our university is a great place and we're super committed to having the students here. Obviously, we're going to have to, we're taking some measures to make sure everyone stays safe. Uh, it's not the normal college experience. I've really tried to preach to not only myself, but our players and our coaches is that we're going to have to be very flexible. Mm -hmm. we have to be patient. You know, I'm a very, I'm, I'm very organized. Some people would call me obsessively compulsive, obsessive compulsive. A matter of fact, I probably have an obsessive compulsive disorder that I've never been diagnosed with, but I'm going to have to be more flexible in terms of changing schedules. That's just going to be a reality of our lives right now. Even in our preparation, you know, normally by this time, it was funny. We had a meeting, with our staff yesterday normally i have by the middle of august i have our whole schedule done september october practice schedule uh days off game schedule uh, even we have a, a bulk of our recruiting days penciled in at this point we don't even have a we're, we have three weeks in september scheduled and that's it because you know we're not sure when we're going to start playing and mm -hmm. a lot of variables out there so it, you know i think flexibility and patience which is probably something you should always practice in your everyday life it's something we're really, really going to have to embrace, and um, and uh, and that and that includes myself as well. So hopefully, we're in that type of mindset, and uh, we can kind of function in that type of environment.
Now, Coach, you, I feel like this recruiting has, has changed forever now. So now with limited budgets, now you can just Zoom a guy. Because I know at your level, at the mid-major level, sometimes the recruiting budget is not what a Power 5 or Power 7 school is, right? So it can save you money on the front end and the back end by Zooming guys. So now no guy's out of reach now because of Zoom. Now the technology has made it better. So you can not have to be on the road so much. I'm late nights driving to see kids. Now you can Zoom them and, and talk to them that way and, and get to give them a Zoom tour to campus. And that way, I feel like recruiting now is closer change forever now for the better yeah definitely i mean i think your reach is can be a little wider um i'm a little old school still that i think there's nothing like a face-to-face -face conversation there's nothing like feeling a campus touching a campus you know that interaction so i do think there are going to be some changes there's going to be some steps that you can where you can really develop a relationship in a different way um and, and it all, it's all going to come down to two is, you know, so much of, of recruiting is, well, what's our competition doing? You know, because if, if our competition at our level, obviously we're not recruiting against the Dukes and, you know, the ACC and the Big East and, you know, that type of thing. But if teams at our level, like the Northeast Conference and the America East and the MAC and, you know, the Patriot League are having kids on campus, then we're going to have to do that as well. So I think, um, but you're right. I think, um, with all the disruption and people are going to be much more careful with their money, you know, not only universities, institutions, and, but just businesses in general. So I think, uh, you know, you're going to have to be a little more uh, creative, innovative, and uh, just do the best you can. But I hope, I hope that the days of face-to-face -face interaction never go away. Cause I think part of me is like, that's what life is all about is, is, getting to know someone, you know, shaking someone's hand and really look at them in the eye face to face. And, and uh, you know, I hope that doesn't go away, but you're right. There's no question that there are different ways to uh, certainly get to the end goal of, you know, cause that's what recruiting is, is, is developing relationships, developing trust. So I think there are other ways to do that now. And uh, we'll try to utilize them the best we can and, and uh, oh, whoever we can to get it. You know, everybody's still going to try to get advantage. Recruiting is about trying to get as much. We, we, we don't want a level playing field. We want to have all the advantages as, as people do. So we're going to do whatever it takes to try to put ourselves in the best position to, uh, to get the best players that fit our, what we're looking for. And, Coach, uh, speaking of that, I know at your level you have to play those guarantee games. And I've seen some contracts, Coach, that I, I don't like what I see, but they say, say if it's no fans, it's this, or if it's fans, it's this. Having to raise money for university, raise money for, for the non-revenue sports, and we don't know if you're going to play non-con because we don't know right now. That, to me, is scary for all across the athletics because, like, hey, a lot of schools, like, I, I went to TSU, Tennessee, Tennessee State University. I know how small school life is. They need those guarantee games to survive for men's basketball, men's basketball, and football. I know that. A lot of schools that, like, that are smaller, they need that. So how do you feel about the possibility of not having those guarantee games to help fund the university right now? That is definitely a problem. There's no question. I just, as a matter of fact, I was talking to our – our associate athletic director who's in charge of budgets and she's the best and we had a meeting she said where are we with guarantees and so well we we don't know if we're going to play them but yeah that's that's a lot of revenue you know anywhere you know at schools our level it could be anywhere from 150 to 450 thousand dollars you know so um i think the approach that certainly sacred heart university is taking but i would say a lot is we got to do whatever you got to do to get through this year. Uh, we know there's going to be a loss of revenue. Um, you know, we have a couple of different contracts out there where we're only going to get 50% of the guarantee uh, if, if there are no fans, which, you know, probably looks like that's going to happen in certainly first semester. Uh, but I, I actually think it's even going to be worse than that. I, I think, you know, certainly we have great leadership in men's basketball. The NCAA does. Uh, Dan Gavin, I think is, is, uh, well respected, brilliant. So I think the biggest focus right now for everybody in Division One men's basketball is let's do whatever we have to do to have a season mm -hmm. because the NCAA tournament is is where the real, real revenue is generated. And not only for men's basketball, but like you said, you know, I, I read this the other day and I don't know if this is accurate, so don't quote me on this, but I think the NCAA men's basketball tournament brings in 
of all the revenue the NCAA brings in. Mm -hmm. So, so the NCAA men's tournament pays for everything. You know, people talk about football and football makes a ton of money for individual schools like Alabama football makes millions of dollars for the university of Alabama, Michigan football makes millions of dollars, but the NCAA men's basketball tournament that pays for everything that pays for the Northeast conference budgets and the Mary, or I would say outside the power seven, you know, uh, well power, I would say the power five in the big East. And I'm not, I don't know who the, the seventh is. I'm trying to think of maybe the American, the American, yep. The American. the American, yeah. Outside of those, maybe those seven conferences and you're throwing Gonzaga, the NCAA tournament funds all these other conferences, the other 25 or so conferences. So, Everybody understands that. And it's not just for men's basketball players. I mean, those, that tournament funds the tennis teams and the golf teams and, the, mm. and all the other teams, which are, listen, like, those are important. You know who those are important to? The golfers and the tennis players and the, you know, whatever, the, the, track, the, 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 the track athletes. You know, those are opportunities for young people that may not have opportunities. So I do think there is a sensitivity and understanding like, hey, we have to do whatever we have to do, not only just for men's basketball, because men's basketball and football are going to be fine because they make money. It's for all the other sports. Most we definitely, have yes. to make to, Because, you know, and I know the NCAA, you know, gets a lot of flack and, you know, and maybe rightfully so at times, but it does create a lot of opportunities for young people that will not, would not be there. You know, all of our players are on a full scholarship. They don't pay a penny to go to school. Now, those of us that pay to go to school understand – how unbelievable that is to go to school. You know, there's my wife put herself through college. She had to work three waitressing jobs on weekends to pay for herself to go through school. So when you can go to school for free, first of all, it creates so many opportunities. I mean, it's, it can be life changing. So we don't want those to go away. Those are, those are, those are opportunities for people that might not have otherwise had one. So I think the main focus, and again, everything is important and money is important is to let's have some type of season so we can play an NCAA tournament so that the, the positive things that the NCAA does can continue. You know, that doesn't mean you don't reform and you don't make changes. Of course you do, and you always try to get better. But let's not, you know, the old saying, and I don't even know where this came from, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater here. Let's, let's remember, like, there's a yes. lot, of, lot of positives that come from this yes. revenue that's generated Sometimes you're like, oh, the NCAA makes all this money. All this money goes back to the schools, goes back to the conferences, which goes back to the students, student athletes, which is a wonderful thing. You know, it's a wonderful thing. And, and, and so our biggest focus is we're going to do whatever is necessary to try to have a season uh, of some sort so we can have an NCAA tournament. Let's find a way to make it happen. Let's make the sacrifices that need to be made to make that happen. I think – most coaches are in that – most basketball coaches are in that mindset and, uh, and then hope for the best. But, again, I, I have the utmost confidence in not only uh, Dan Gavitt but also our NABC leadership that we're going to do whatever it takes for, for the membership to uh, make sure this happens and, and, and hope for the best. And, and, and again, at that point, we're, we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to be super, super flexible and, and – and, um, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's the way we got to go. And, and because, you know, we have no other options, you know, and, you know, and I think the other thing too is, you know, we talked about what were some of the positives of this is I think all of us, myself included, not just coaches, but just in general, there's a lot of things that we take for granted that have taken for granted for so many, so long. It's just yes. And now we're like, wow, things can be changed. Things can change like that. Life can change like that. Boy, we had it pretty good. How many people would say, man, we would just love to get back to normal? Yes. You know, normal was pretty good for, for, for most of us. <laughs> you know I mean? And again, that doesn't mean it was perfect. And obviously, a lot of things are going on in the world that are showing that life is far from perfect. But I do think I've always, and I don't know, you know, you know, I, I probably learned this from my family who kind of came over here uh, from Italy as, as immigrants that didn't speak any English. And I think I've always learned to try to have gratitude for the things that you have. Uh, come from a place of humility, 
and know that, you know, things, you always got to fight to make things better, but always try to come from that mindset and because things can change and there's no guarantees. And so I'm really looking forward to trying to make this the best year possible for our team, our program, try to, you know, do some positive things for our guys, have a great experience, make some positive changes. You know, always keep in mind and try to make things better, but understand that, you know, if you're here on a full basketball scholarship at Sacred Heart University, which I think is a first class, you know, uh, institution, and these guys are going to get a first class education, you know, we got to come from a, you know, from a, a place of gratitude. So I, I've, I've used that word probably 50 times in the last. No, it was a great years. word, a great word, coach, a great was, word. You know, it's, it was, you know, the old saying, if we, if we magnified our blessings as much as we magnified our disappointments, we'd all be a lot happier and we'd all be a lot more fulfilled. And, and, and so I'm really going to try to stress that not only for myself, my, my family, but my basketball family here as well. Let's magnify our blessings and let's, let's, let's make this work the best we can. And hopefully, you know, people a lot smarter than me can figure this out and make things a little safer uh, from the medical side, a little safer for people in the, in, in our communities and society. And um, let's all, you know, let's all try to, come from that type of place. There was a great line I heard, you know, the other thing too is, is in this situation, I, I think sometimes people listen to respond to things. And I think one of the things that I've learned, and this is a line that I've heard multiple times in the last six months is, I think we need to start listening more to understand. You know, listen to people. Sometimes we're having a conversation and we're just listening, waiting for you to finish talking so I can respond rather than say, all right, what is someone else saying? Especially when it comes to important things in life is let's try to listen to understand a little bit. And uh, if we do that, I think things, I think things will be, things will improve. Oh, <laughs> and, definitely. And that's what we're trying to do. But I really appreciate uh, having a chance to actually talk to you and look at you. This is a little different interview than last <laughs> one. Yes. But that's kind of where we're at right now. And coach, you know, uh, since George Floyd and things have happened here in Georgia, Rayshard, Brooks, and Brown Taylor, and our model library. I decided to use my show to help in the community. And, Coach, I feel like I never thought I'd be in activism, Coach. I never thought I would get involved in that. But I felt motivated to do so because I'm 33, have a platform that reaches from Chattanooga through making 1.1 million listeners beyond the digital platform. So I can affect changing people. And, you know, wearing the being with the with Atlanta Hawks and working around the Hawks players. I feel like I have a platform to give people a new perspective that hey, we can do this together. We we I, my my dad was a barber coach. So I've I've been doing with people my whole life in the barber shop. You know, he's a barber. My mama's a, 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 a psychologist. So from day one, I've done different backgrounds from day one. I can do it to anybody by like any background, right? So knowing that I've said I'm gonna still cover my sports, but also talk to people that make a positive change because together what's going on in the world, we're now talking about us coming together as one to find common ground, happy medium to just agree on these set of right and wrong principles to make things better for everybody generation after us going forward. Because my dad's 80 years old today. I'm 33, so we got two different directions apart, pretty much age-wise. So I'm looking down the road, and he, he grew up in an area where it was segregated Atlanta. He could cross railroad tracks after dark, right? So he's lived these things, and I'm living a little bit differently than him, but I want to make it better for the those after me, coach. So that's why I feel like, you know, this COVID has gave me a chance, and things has happened the world has inspired me to use my platform for good and be better and help people be better going forward, coach. Oh, no question. I mean, that's, you said that, you couldn't have said that any, any better. It, it, it's, I mean, that's what, hey, listen, we all, we all want the same things. Everyone wants, to, uh, everyone wants to feel safe. Everyone wants to, you know, have an opportunity. Uh, I mean, all of us, this is the thing that I always try to stress to our guys, and, and I've been blessed to play basketball. I grew up in, in a city. I grew up in Hartford, which was a very diverse city. And the one thing I find is people are a lot more alike than they are different. Yes. We're all unique. We're all unique, but we're a lot more alike than we are different. And I think uh, that doesn't mean we have, don't have different perspectives and different life experiences because we certainly do. And um, and again, you don't you don't ignore those things and you don't pretend that they don't exist. Of course, that you do. You try to make things better. But 
if we come from a place of, hey, we're a lot more alike, we probably want most of the same, the important things is like we want the same things. And I think you try to listen to understand, then things start getting better. I mean, these things happen on an individual level. I think, you know, as, as you know, relationships develop and, and, and people see different people and they say, wow, he's a great person and that person's a great person and this is not what I thought and that's not what I thought and stuff like that. I think, I think things get better. So I'm, I'm a very optimistic person by nature, but I am super optimistic. I think when all this is over, coronavirus and a lot of the civil unrest, I think we're going to come out a lot better. I really believe that. I, I'm not one of these people that says, uh, you know, things are getting worse. I don't believe that. I think things are going to get better. I think things are getting better. I think the fact that things can be discussed now um, more freely than they ever were is a positive, you know? And I think now the one thing that we need to do is because sensitive topics are being discussed much more freely, I think the empathy and understanding has to increase with that. Yes. Because now we are going to talk about things uh, now that we didn't maybe talk about 25 years when I first started coaching. And in doing that, we have to all, and this is an individual thing, and I think everybody has to do this individually, is, hey, listen to understand. Listen with empathy. Listen with humility. Know that you don't know. Great, uh, great philosopher, I don't know if it was Socrates or Aristotle or Plato, one of them said, I know that I don't know. And that's why, that's the, where the wisdom is, is, is that you know you don't know everything. And that you can learn something. You know, I, one of the things I'm stressing to my players is you want to, you want to have a good day. There's three things you got to get better. You got to get better every day. And three things you got to become a better, you got to, you got to do three different areas. You got to get better your body. That's physical, whether it's a workout, whatever your mind. All right. Are you reading and your soul? And that's different to a lot of different people. If you got better in those three areas today, that's that's a heck of a day. Yes, you know, indeed. I if you get better in three years, if you if you had exercised or worked out or whatever whatever level you are, if you're a basketball player and you you worked on your game or you push yourself, that's a good thing. If you read a book that maybe you wouldn't read or exercised your mind and then exercise your soul, which is again that that's a tricky thing. You know, we're a Catholic university, so you know our easiest way to exercise soul is prayer. But there's other ways. Some people don't believe in God, which is which is fine. So maybe you meditate or maybe you do something. Maybe you have a gratitude journal. But let's make sure we're getting better in those three areas every day. If, if people are committed to doing those three things, we'll be a healthier society. We'll be in a more, a more uh, educated society. And we will be a more tolerant society. And then then things are really going to get better. But again, I'm optimistic. And I'm, I'm, I think this is we're going to be better for this. All of this, you know, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, most growth happens when you're uncomfortable. Yes. And, and a lot of us are very uncomfortable right now <laughs> for a variety of reasons, whether it's your, your 80 year old dad or my 87 year old father not being able to, my dad goes to his club, his Italian club. He hasn't been there in six months. That, other than spending time with his family, that's his favorite thing to do. And he hasn't done that. And I have two, two older sisters and I said, man, you know, when do we think it's safe to let him go to there? And I'm like, you got to understand, I'm trying to do, it's a, this is important to him. This was his thing. Mm -hmm. I know it's not important to you guys. You guys think it's silly, but it's important to him. So I think, I think that we're all making our own sacrifices in our own way. And, and, but just to understand that we're all going through things. And I think a lot of this, a lot of what's happening is also that because so many difficult things are happening, that people aren't struggling with that whether it's being cooped up in the house or whether it's, you know, you just got pushed. So I, I think, um, you know, doing those things will, will help. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it uh, to have the opportunity. Again, like you said, your platform and to use whatever platform you have to try to make things better. You know how, you know, I, I always say, are you making things better? Or are you making things worse? Cause you ain't, cause you're doing one or the other. I always tell that to our players. Are you guys making us a better, are you making us a better team or a worse team? Are you making things better out here or worse? And if you can't say definitely better, then you got to reevaluate how you're approaching this thing here. So um, that's what we're going to try to do. I'm sure we'll make a lot of mistakes, all of us. But if we come from the right, uh, I think the right intentions and the right place and come from, a, you know, 
I think things will get better. And, and I'm, I'm, I, I really look forward to it. And, and, um, and I think sports is a great way because, yes. you know, people come from so many different areas. You know, they, you know sports, is, sports is the ultimate meritocracy. Like, if you can play, you can play. If you can't play, you can't play. <laughs> it don't matter. Anything else don't matter. So I think, uh, you know, we're going to try to do, you know, uh, what we can in our little community to make things better. And maybe that spreads to other places. And, and uh, that's what we're going to try to do. But um, it, it's, it's, been, it's been a difficult situation. We've had a lot of, like I said, uncomfortable, uh, difficult conversations. But that's, you know, the more we're comfortable being uncomfortable, the more we're going to grow. The most growth happens in those times. Yes. Yes. And coach, you know, for me, like I can tell a story. 1994, I didn't meet my first white kid tonight. I was seven years old, coach. That's when travel baseball, so sports. <laughs> Tell me about another race, another background I wasn't exposed to until playing travel baseball. So you're, you're so right. Sports brings us together because I never would have met my friends, Kyle and Derek, the twins, who my, who my friends since day if I'd ever played travel baseball baseball with them because I hadn't met any white kids until seven years old, 94, which is wild, you know, so so it's, yeah. you're so right, sports is your equalizer, it can bring us all from different backgrounds for one common goal as a team, to represent the name on the front, the name on the back, to win a, to win a game together. No question, no, no, no doubt about it, so, no, it's, it's, you know, so we just got to keep doing the right things and, and, and keep doing our best and, and, you know, be, be, you know, be understanding as, as we can of people know that people are going to make mistakes. Um, let's not bury somebody when they make a mistake, no matter who it is. You know what I mean? When, if, if, if whether it's, uh, you know, it, let, let's try to, you know, that's the one thing I, I fear is, is people are going to make mistakes. So especially as we have more difficult conversations, things might be said that, offend so let's understand hey well, what where you came from and and you know how do we correct this and, and why did that bother you but not bother me because i don't understand why that's bothering you I, I have no idea but it really is so tell me maybe help me to understand that so i i'm really trying to encourage that my players because there are certain things that play, my players say that really bother me but they don't bother them and i'm like well I, i'm trying to understand how does that not bother you you know so i think there's there's that part of it and um, but again, I think when we all come back to, we're a lot more alike than we're a lot yes. more different. Then, boy, you know, when you come from that place and that thought, you know, you're, you're right. We we all want to be fulfilled, and we all want to be happy, and we all want to have opportunity. And that, that those are universal. I don't care where, whether it's the United States of America or you know, the most remote island on this in the world. I mean, that's what people want, and and. That's what people need, and that's where people thrive. So, you know, we got to all try to come to there, and, and it's not going to be easy, um, but it's worthwhile. You know oh, what I mean? Definitely. And most things that are worthwhile aren't easy. <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, Coach Latina, this has been great to catch up with you, man, and, and see you, man. We can have this great conversation, man, about life and just how we can make things better, man, and how Sacred Heart's going to be do their part, man. It's been enjoyable. We'll do this again real soon. We'll do another, another Zoom, coaches. I really enjoyed this, man. I enjoyed it tremendously. You stay safe. Happy birthday to your father. Please, you know, have a great day with him. And anytime, I would love to speak to you. I really enjoyed our time. Anytime, Coach. Hey, you be good, buddy. We'll do it again real soon, man. All right. Take care. All right. See you, buddy. How do you feel about your office? Is it just a space for your company, or is it a space to help you grow your company? From new HQs to satellite offices, with WeWork, you can find a space that works for you. Visit we.co slash space matters to learn more. All right, folks. Back in the Boss Man Show, friend of the show. Ryan Ritter, the coach of the Bethune Cookman Wildcats. Coach, man, glad to see you again and glad to have you back. I hope you've been safe, my buddy. Man, it's great to see you. Great to be back. Um, always enjoy our conversations pre uh, preseason. Yes, indeed. Well, coach, I got to ask you, man. I kind of told you, I told you off there about how the season stopped on my birthday for the NBA and on March 11th. So, where were you guys at in that situation? Was it the MEAC tournament probably? So, how did you guys? handle news when it came down and for us getting kids back home and go from virtual learning to from being in class. So how's it for you and your team and your staff, man, that whole whirlwind and march around on my birthday there? 
You know, that, that particular day was really, really tough for our program. Um, we got, we had six seniors and we had a good regular season, but um, we really felt like we were playing our best basketball, you know, had one, I think six out of seven going into the uh, tournament. And those six seniors had finally really come into their own. And, and we were actually, we were eating pregame meal uh, three hours before our, our first round game. And uh, we're told that our season was coming to an end. So um, obviously the basketball side was really tough, but you know, um, those six guys that have put so much blood, sweat, and tears, um, that was tough to see their college career in that way because so many questions they have at that time of, well, you know, coach, what do I have eligibility? Do I go get a job? Am I trying to play professionally? And, and you know, that can be overwhelming for a, you know, 21, 22 year old kid. So um, that particular day was tough on our program. Um, you know, but since then, just really trying to help those guys transition into, you know, whatever their endeavors are professionally, um, whether it's basketball job, parenting, um, and then also trying to regroup with the with the guys we got coming back. Um, you know, obviously no face to face meetings. We're we're trying to stay as organized as we can and and try to provide as much patience and flexibility. But at the end of the day, you know, the the virus is in charge, and and that's what we're trying to um, help guide our guys right now and to to as much safely safe safely as we can. I know a, a key person on your staff was academic advisor because having kids going home and to be on their own devices, make sure their grades stay up, stay eligible to play with their grades and had to be rough. I know you can look at on, on Blackboard what the, what the guys are doing, but how was that trying to make sure the guys stayed on top of the academics when they were back home and kind of not knowing what's going on in, in the world around them? Yeah, I mean, that's the toughest part because, um, you know, we've got a great uh, uh, student athlete success team at, at our at our school and, um, we do have a very, very good academic advisor, but all of a sudden you, you have 15 guys that are now either all re learning remotely, um, and some of them are, have not taken online classes before, some of them have. And so, um, you know, just the communication was really key, um, being able to, to provide that for each of our guys and having them have their own individual coaches where we've, they're grouped into, you know, groups of three or four, and, and they're able to kind of connect with coaches on a daily basis, and then we we're able to help relay that academic information. So, um, you know, we, we had a good spring. I think we've got a really good handle on this fall um, in terms of, of our academic situation. But, man, you're right. That, that, that position is so huge in college athletics. And I know the parents are probably even talking to you more than ever now because of all the uncertainty. So how's, been, how's the parent involvement been in getting closer to the parents again after you recruited the guys and the parents and you kind of recruit them again is, is kind of make sure that they're, they're young men is okay. So how's that been dealing with the parents here and, how, and all their concerns about the question with the virus and when the guys are coming back on campus and are you going to play? How's, how's that process been? Yeah, that, that, that's a, that is a great question. And that's actually um... – you know, this year we've got 15 young men on our roster. Um, we finally, in year four, been able to recruit um, some younger kids, some some four-year transfers, some guys that, um, you know, we've been recruiting the last two, three years. So we've gotten a chance to really know their parents, their AU coaches, their high school coaches. So that network around them has been really strong. Um, so the communication with the parents, um, I, I've welcomed everything. we every Any question they have, I don't know the answers, but I will try to find them out for them. And I think just assuring them that, that we're doing everything safely um, and, and in their, in their um, son's best interest has been key for us. Um, you know, as of right now, you know, we're not even actually working our guys out. We're going through additional um, safety testing to make sure that we're, we're putting these guys in the best position, um, one, academically, but then two is, is before we put them on a court, making sure we're doing everything we can um, to, to make sure they're, they're as safe as they can be. How's it in Florida? I know here in Georgia, it's been still kind of steadily high with the virus. So in your area in Daytona, how's it been? Is numbers coming down? Or, or do you think it'd be safe for the guys to come back on campus in, in the near future here where they feel safe and it's not before flu and cold season starts here real soon? Yeah, you know, it's, it depends on which day of the week you ask. You know, every, every time I start feeling like we're having a positive shift, um, you know, we'll have a, a potential cluster breakout or or something happens, um, not necessarily on our campus. We've been fortunate so far. Our guys have been back for almost two weeks, and um, we've had very, very minimal um, COVID cases on campus, so we've done a great job protecting our students that way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on, on the day you ask. I, I think we are, as of right now, showing progress, um, specifically in, in Volusia County, where is, is Daytona Beach, where Bethune-Cookman is. But, you know, as soon as I say that, you know, tomorrow can be a different day, and, and – um, you know, we're, we're doing our best on campus. I know that. I know our leaders, our president, um, our safety council has done a heck of a job of putting in parameters to, to make these guys feel and, and be as safe as they can.
And coach, haven't talked to your young men about being able to say no when they want to say yes because you no, know, their guys are 18, 19, 20 years old. They want to go out. They want to go see their friends and go maybe go to a party, but to make them it's a bigger than them right now. You can't do that because one little incident that you might think is innocent that you could cause a whole outbreak of a whole team and then a whole department. So how have you always dressed to the young men that, hey, you might want to say yes, but you have to say no, like sacrifice for the greater good of everybody involved in our community as well. Yeah, that, that's been the hardest challenge. And I think the message we've tried to tell our guys is be a great teammate. And that, that's on the court, that's off the court, that's in the community. And um, ultimately you're going you're gonna to have these urges to, to do those things you're talking about. Um, and then throw on top of the fact that we actually aren't allowed to work our guys out right now for safety reasons. So they're, they're in their mind trying to find any way they can to, to get their hands on a ball. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's not safe right now for us. Um, we haven't done everything possible. So to be able to um, challenge them to be a great teammate, and that, that means staying compliant and being flexible. And um, you may feel fine. You may feel like something um, is, is beneficial for you. But at the end of the day, when you're part of a team, you know, you got to put that organization ahead of yourself. And I think that's kind of been our message to our guys, not just our basketball team, but our Bethune-Cookman family, our Daytona Beach family, our state family. You know, their people back home is you're a part of something much, much bigger, and you, you got to make decisions based on that group rather than yourself. Most definitely. I've been a, a good – I've learned the word no a lot, Coach, in the last five months because, yep. you no, know, having an 80-year-old dad – I worry about that because my dad's 80 years old today. So he's not young and he, and he can attack yep. older people. And I don't want to be selfish and go out and have a drink or whatever and come back to my dad and dead in a month, you know? And I'm like, wow, that's on me. So just that example of my father keeps me at bay, even though I do get struck crazy, but I got to protect my father and myself as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So same thing we're fighting down here is I got a, uh, I share with you off fair, I've got a daughter that's one month old. And so we quarantined for so long because I didn't want to take a risk. One, I just, you don't know how, how it plays out in pregnant people. Um, but also the fact is uh, if somehow I were to contract it, then, then I'm not able to go into the hospital for the birth of my second daughter. And, and now you're talking about all kinds of different things that, that could potentially happen. So we've, we've tried to keep ourselves as safe as we can down here. Now, Coach, when the guys were at home during the, the, the shutdown, uh, did you guys give them like a strength plan to kind of make sure they was could have some kind of semblance of shape now that they're coming back to you here in August? Because I know uh, I know when, when you shut down, you might not have a hoop to get to, but doing like walking and running and a little exercise they maybe can do in their yards to kind of keep them somewhat in shape, not quite basketball shape, but some shape. So they not having to start from scratch once you get back to them here right now. We can't work them out once safety, safety measures are cleared. Yeah, that's, that's another great question. Um, we've got a great strength and conditioning coach at, at, and program at Bethune-Cookman. And so obviously we followed the NCAA um, guidelines on what we were able to do, but um, we, we definitely had our returners and, and guys that were cleared. Um, we, we had them a, a strength and conditioning program uh, that they were able to do at home um, if they were able to access equipment safely and, and they, could, they could do that um, without putting anybody um, in, in danger or, or at risk. Um, but, you know, JR, I'll be honest with you, the, the thing that we did the most this offseason, um, we talked. We, we, had, we, we talked with our guys. We spent a lot of time on Zooms. Um, we talked about social injustices. We talked about things that, um, you know, we could do to make a difference outside of basketball. And, and you know, sometimes we become so consumed with the sports that um, the season comes and wins and losses and this and this. And you really sometimes forget to connect with guys. And so, you know, really the last three months, um, we spent a lot of time understanding each person on our team and how we can help each other, but ultimately how we can help this, this nation as we go forward. And coach, you make bring up a great point. Social justice issues. Cause you no, know, I've taken charge using my show once George Floyd happened to discuss these issues because I felt a need. And, you know, my father grew up in the civil rights era. You know, my father grew up in Sierra Atlanta when it was segregated. We couldn't cross the railroad tracks by after dark. So I talked to my father. I felt I needed to use my platform, which I got from 1.1 million listeners from Chattanooga to Macon. So I have to use this for good. So I felt like, you know, that, 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 that burden to say, hey, I got to do this for, for, for everybody because I, I, people like me. You know, my dad was a barber, Coach Ritter. So I, from day one, I'm writing for different people all day long. So I don't care who I can do with anybody because I'm just used to my, my, my father. So I have to use the gift that I got as a young man for good with the radio show. So 
I, I feel like it's so important that we use sports to bring uh, us together because sports are going to be a unifying force in, in our society and in our country. Yeah, you know, I, I, th- I think you're right on the money, and and um, you know, I, I've got a I've got a unique perspective. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a white guy at an HBCU coaching um, young black athletes, and um, you know, for for me, it's been it's been so eye opening, and, and working at HBC, HBCU um, has has been educational for me to really understand. You know, you, you grow up playing basketball, you understand different perspectives, um, you understand you know diversity, but uh, to really sit down and understand you know, I'm not, I'm not black. You know, I'm looking at you right now. You can see, I will never be black. I, I, I don't know what it's like to stand in your shoes, but to be able to empathize and understand, man, what, what does systemic racism mean? What do these words and what does inequality really look like? You know, what is white privilege for me to sit down and have these real conversations that I thought I knew so much about um, has been great to help, hopefully um, help put us on a platform to help continue to change some of these things. And coach, you're in a perfect situation because you no, know, you are a white guy with HBCU because you can help other whites who don't understand who won't listen to me, but will hear from you because sometimes you hear from who you call you call from. So I feel like it's great to you're in that position to help these young men. And and how have those calls been with the players on Zoom, trying to educate them and educating you and educating each other? Because I feel like the more we talk about these uncomfortable things, that's how we really enact and go and get change we want for everybody involved. Yeah, I, you know what? If it, it depends on the call. Some of them have been extremely emotional, sad almost, uh, frustrated, angry. Um, and then you have some uplifting moments. Um, you see hope. You, 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 see, you see potential change. Um, but, you know, as of, you know, events as of, of recent as, as yesterday, the last couple of days, um, it kind of puts in perspective where we are as a country. And um, uh, it, it, it's sad. You know, just just to be point blank, I said in a meeting, uh, our first team meeting last week, and uh, one of my favorite guys, I won't use his name, but um, he's a big, big, big black dude with long hair and tattoos. And he's standing up and and he said, Coach, why do people hate me because of the way I look? And, I mean, you want to talk about melting someone's heart? I I, I just hugged him and I said, man, I I hope my daughters get to grow up to marry someone like you. And that's the stories we got to get out to to the general public of i think a lot of times white people in particular are scared of what they don't know and they're scared of 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 the unknown well there's uh, so many times there's not real genuine relationships between black and white people they don't want to understand uh or empathize where someone's come from and i think our our university is is um and our team we've done a great job of trying to understand and empathize and, and ultimately make change together so um but those meetings are raw they're hard sometimes I mean, that's, that's just the truth of it. And, Coach, I'll tell you a quick story from personal perspective for me. From, I didn't meet my first white kid to the to 94. I was seven years old. So it took travel baseball for me to get introduced to white kids. I never met them since yeah. seven, I was seven years old, Coach. And so I know how sports can help us understand each other. And it could be an uh, example for our country because when you play sports, it's not about JR, a black guy, Ryan, a white guy. We're trying to win, win together. It don't matter, you know, and then we can talk to each other. Then you, you, then you learn about each other. Then you, because you like them and you, you learn about them, then you understand, oh, wow, that's why you think that way. That's what molded, your, molded you. So I feel like sports coach is such a opportunity to give our country an example of what we can be. When, when we are together and see each everybody as a person, not white or black, we're just people trying, with a common goal and a common stance and a kind of common mission to get the job done and win a game together and the game of life together as well. Yeah, uh, I, I think you're right on the money. It, it, it's about humanity at this point. I, I don't think it's a, you know, it's about what's doing right. Everyone's talked politics and this, this, and that. At the end of the day, we got some issues that um, they're, they're humane and we, we got to get those figured out. And I think you know, from, from me speaking personally, we've got a great crop of young black men on our team that they can be a strong, powerful voice. And on top of that, um, you know, I, I do feel like I'm in a position of, uh, you know, it's not, the, it's not the people who have been oppressed. It's not their job to fix the oppression. It's the people that are, are, are it's the oppressors that need to be the ones that, that they got to make some changes. And, um, you know, I think I, I know we're up for the challenge. I know we're trying to figure that part out. And I think I've got some great people around me that, um, you know, can really help put this movement continue to help with with the movement that's going on right now. 
And coach, I know recruiting. I'm asking about recruiting wise. Uh, do you feel like how, how you like the, the, the Zoom recruiting this season around? Cause I know usually you'd be on the road, uh, trying try to trying to find great young men to bring in Bethune Cookman. But how was the recruiting via Zoom and doing campus visits via Zoom this uh, during the COVID time here? How, has that something you maybe keep in the future, or a little bit of mix of face face to face and, and and the Zoom mix to kind of expand your reach there? Yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you, actually, from recruiting standpoint, um, it, I don't know if it would happen every year, but it worked out great for us this year. Um, we targeted three kids really, really hard. You know, we signed um, two early in the fall. Well, that was before all this happened. That was great. Two young kids felt really good about them. Um, but come, come Christmas time, we really targeted three, well, two guys um, during Christmas. And then when the season ended, um, we targeted a Division One transfer. And so there was three guys that we were just on every single day. And uh, we built a heck of a relationship with them and the people around them. And, um, you know, when it came to decision time, and I'll just be transparent with you, we, we don't have the nicest facilities. We don't have some of the nicest bells and whistles on campus, but we got genuine people that want to make a difference. And so when it came to decision time, when you just make decisions based on relationships, you know, we, we got those three kids that we had put a lot of time and effort where, Sometimes when you're younger, you may choose, um, uh, you know, a facility or something, a uniform that's maybe not um, as important long run. So for us, man, that it actually worked out great. We, we targeted the guys. We got them, we got who we wanted, and we're fired up about them. Most definitely. And also, Coach, I'm worried about you guys for this reason because I've seen some of these uh, guarantee game contracts. I got a few of them in my email with that whole if if you if you if you got fans, it's this number. If you don't have it, this number. HBCU schools have to pay to raise money to pay for the non revenue sports. It's have to. And uh, how yeah. is that being not knowing whether you're going to have a non conference season to raise money for the school because it's so important to fund all the other sports and their scholarships and those people in the university. So, how is that been trying to navigate that with, with the legal department and the, and the other schools trying to make the schedule right for, for you guys? Well, you know, that, that has been difficult because there's just, you know, I think I looked at it the other day out of the 350 plus Division One teams, only somewhere between 20 and 30 had released their schedule. So, um, you know, everyone's kind of fighting that issue right now. Um, but, you know, we prepared like we were going to have a normal November, December non-conference. But I think as we're getting kind of closer to this mid-September date, I think there's some feelings that those may change. So, um, you know, right now we're, we're prepared to play um, and, and we've got our guarantee games lined up. But we've had great dialogue with our administration, with our legal department. Um, if those things don't happen, how could we potentially raise more money? What would be the goal of our institution? Um, but the other thing, too, is if we don't have a non-conference season, well, now we're not spending as much money. Um, so there's a lot of things to work out there. But, you know, at the end of the day, I said it right when we first started talking, that this, this virus is going to tell us what to do, um, whether we like it or not. And then, you know, we'll, we'll try to be um, as flexible and frugal as we can in terms of non-conference. Well, Coach Ritter, I wish you all the best, buddy. I'm praying for your, you and your team to you get out there and play some games, man, because I know you, you guys need the resources for sure to make sure you guys are taken care of and not have to pinch pennies elsewhere, man. I love our, love, love, our, love our chats, man. Good to see you on this soon. Good to see yeah, you, man. Yeah, to see you as well. <laughs> so we got to yep, do this again yep, real I, soon, I, brother. <laughs> that sounds great, man. I appreciate you. I always enjoy being on the show. Anytime, Coach. Thank you, buddy. Talk to you real soon, man. All right. Thank you. All right. It's Ryan Ritter here on the Boss Man Show.